Merry Christmas. It's after Thanksgiving and the decorations are up, so that means it's Christmas time. <laughs> All right, let's please stand and sing with me. Victory in Jesus. glorious day you've blessed us with again here this morning and uh, we're just grateful for all these people that are able to be here and uh, and just to sing your praises and uh, and to join in that victory that is in Jesus we are so thankful even though we're getting into the Christmas season I'm still in the Thanksgiving season Lord I just I'm thankful for that gift of your son Jesus I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here in a free country to to serve you on a Sunday morning and I just pray that this service this morning be uh just be a, a, a light here in this community and, uh, and may you just be looking down and, and smile and say how you love your people and, and how we love you back. Be with us all as we, uh, as, we come, as we bring this service forth to you and may the singing and the, and the words all be to your will and your will alone. It's Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. My Redeemer. i 
upon the midnight clear. It's going to be taken out of uh, Habakkuk 3. The very end of Habakkuk, chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Ye three kings of Orientar, verses 1 and 5.
I survey the wondrous cross. We're going to do all four verses. If you haven't had the opportunity to get your communion yet, um, I think almost everybody is kind of on board with that. Uh, we do have the have the cups that are all pre pre wrapped in the back. And if you don't, and uh, you prefer not to, if you have a hard time fiddling getting that paper off, like I sometimes do, um, just raise your hand, and Quentin will be happy to to bring communion to you too this morning. Like I, I mean, I really enjoy the decorations this morning. I love Christmas too, but um, I think I like Thanksgiving better. Um, granted, we're um, celebrating Christmas already this morning, but um, I'm going to take you back two days to Thanksgiving. If you can go back that far, <laughs> we're going to talk about Thanksgiving again. And the reason, the reason I say that is because of the passage I read this morning in, in Habakkuk. Um, I know it was just three short verses and. Um, and just to hear that, hear those three short verses, it's hard to really get in tune what's being said there. And I know, and I know, Greg will elaborate on that here shortly. But um, but just reading that um, just brought a lot of things to mind for me, and especially Thanksgiving. And um, like I said, that's it. Actually, is one of my favorite ho holidays. Um, um, and I was thinking about it and wondering, well, why would I consider it one of my favorite holidays? And and I don't. It's not about the food, because if it was about the food, we'd have turkey once a week, right? If we really love turkey. Um, I think what it's about is when our families um, have that opportunity to come together. Um, I don't know what it is. You know, I, I look back and uh, I guess I can think of the pilgrims and the Indians getting together, um, being thankful for what, for all they had. And, um, and it was an opportunity for the two to show each other things and and uh, and become one basically, um, but anyway, I that's I think that's what I enjoy about Thanksgiving. It used to be one of our family traditions uh, for everybody to go around the table and 
and say something that they're thankful for, you know, and um, and, and and Joy did that with us this year, but um, but then after that we kind of jumped into prayer and um, but it was a it was a year to be to be thankful for. Um, I suppose we could have. Let's see. I, I got all confused because I added a bunch of stuff in there. I guess what I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and read the scripture once again that I read earlier, and it's going to come out of a different version. Though the fig tree does not bloom, there is no fruit on the vines. Though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will triumph in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Yahweh, my Lord, is my strength. He makes me like those of a deer. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountain heights. Habakkuk's prayer concluded with a thanksgiving. You know, the beginning of that, when it talks about the, the buds not blooming and the in the fields not producing, and no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls. We can look at that a little bit um, on this year, can't we? Um, I, I know over this year I probably have, I don't want to say complaining, but I think I've heard more distraughtness out of people than I have in a long time. Um, how, how woeful a year it's been. Um, but yet through all this, um, we have lots to be thankful for, and that's what Habakkuk was doing here. Um, I, I challenge you to read. It's only three chapters, so it won't take you long to read, but I challenge you to read it because you'll hear of all the hardship in, chapter, in the first two and a half chapters, and then he gives his prayer of thanks in the end. I'm going to look back on a year, and there's three things that, uh, that, uh, that are powerful reasons why we are thankful for things as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table today. One is we can be thankful even in the absence of what we might consider important. Like I said, what a year we had. I know this family that was planning a summer vacation for like over a year. The mom and dad became sick. Turns out that they got a virus uh, that was able to spread to others, so the trip was canceled. We considered important important at the time, but it says right here we can be thankful even in the absence. Well, that didn't end. Six weeks later, they got this call from their son. He'd made a mistake in his life and it might cost him his marriage. And then through this whole time, here's this, here's this dad that was struggling with uh, this pain in his back and, and his hips and could hardly walk and get around. But uh, as a believer in Jesus, we have much to be thankful for, even in the absence of what we might consider important. We put a lot of other things that are more important. Number two is for the awareness of that which is pure blessing. Let me introduce you to grace, grace, God's grace. God does, not, God does not give us what we deserve, and in exchange even gives us what we don't deserve. The third one, because of the insurance of Christ's, assurance of Christ's atonement. Maybe Habakkuk could not yet understand the impact of the God of his salvation. But as believers in Jesus Christ, we now recognize that this is not just our physical rescue, but his salvation is our spiritual rescue. The Lord's Supper gives us this opportunity to give thanks. First Chronicles 16.8 Give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. 
And also in Psalm 118, he tells us again, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. As we prepare ourselves for communion, I'm reminded of a song that, um, that we've sang quite a few times here. I'm not going to sing it, but I'm going to let you kind of kind of close your eyes and, and be in prayer as we get ready for the communion time. And I will read the words of this song. It's a short song, but uh, it's all about thanksgiving. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his son. And now, let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. Father in heaven, as we gather together here now at this table, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We are thankful. Thank you, Lord, for your son Jesus, who sacrificed himself on a cross so we, the weak, could become strong. Thank you, Jesus, for your life, for your love for us, for your sharing of your broken body and shed blood to give us, the weak, a chance to become strong. Father, as we uh, partake of these emblems that represent your broken body and shed blood, let us be mindful of what we're doing. Let us be thankful for your enduring love for us and everything we do, and we do it in remembrance of you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. I had an, another piece of paper, I think I left it in my seat, that I had written down some of the prayer requests. Oh, I guess we have a special prayer. Sorry. Go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs>
Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear, now is at stake. Humbling your hearts unto God, saving from the chastening rod. Seek the way pilgrims trod, Christians away. Jesus is Jesus coming, is coming soon. Morning or night, or night or noon. Many will many will meet their doom. Prophets will sound. All of the dead shall, shall rise. Righteously lead in the skies. Going where no one no dies. Heavenward bound. Troubles will soon be war. war. Happy for Happy heaven and more. When we meet on the land shore, free from all care. Rising up, rising up in the sky, telling this world, this world goodbye. Onward we then will fly, glory to share. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night, night or noon. Many will be there too, prophets will sound. All of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the sky. Going where no one dies, heavenward Okay, now as we uh, come to our prayer time, um, we had a few this morning in Sunday school. Um, I remember some of them, but if there's any others out there that uh, somebody might need special prayer for that weren't here in Sunday school that need need prayer, um, share with us now. Um, you know, I spoke a little earlier in the communion meditation about blessings. If that wasn't a blessing that we all just received right there, I don't know what it was. Um, some of us uh, can't carry a tune in a bucket, but then people people that can sing great harmony like that, it's just, it, it's beautiful music to our ears. And that's, I'm, I'm so grateful to have, have people that give us those blessings in our lives. 
Well, I know of uh, I know of Bill McCarty um, has um, is in the hospital now. I mean, they just got moved to Arizona, got all settled in, and now Bill has pneumonia and slash COVID. So we need to be praying for Bill because um, he's getting up in age there and um, having both of those. Um, um, we need to pray for his health for sure. Um, I know there's quite a few people just within the congregation that are sick. I know some of the Greshams are, are sick, not feeling well, and and um, who else? Um, oh yeah, Tyson um, Tyson uh, Schroeder. Uh, he came back for Thanksgiving and wasn't feeling well and ended up in the hospital. He had a great Thanksgiving here in Colorado. He was in the hospital, but um, but he's better um, and, and heading back to Kansas City today. Um, so um, that's all I can think of right now. Uh, continued prayer for Fred. We talked with uh, Fred and Denise um, this morning in Sunday school. They had tests taken last week, but um, hadn't got the results back, but continue to pray for that situation. I know Thurston was concerned with some tests coming up. Um, Mark hasn't heard a lot back, I don't think, on his stuff, on his tests yet. Um, just continue to pray for Mark's health and, and pray for good news and, and um, that he's able to get on with life again, eh? <laughs> okay. I hadn't heard any more um, from Glenn. I talked to Glenda Wednesday night. She was going over to Glenn and Elsie's for uh, Thanksgiving. Um, she was staying here for Thanksgiving, and then she left to go see her sister up in Greeley or wherever it is she lives. But um, I know they were the five of them were going to get together for, for Thanksgiving, so they were able to do that. But uh, we'll continue to play, pray for Glenn, too. All right, well, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, then. Father in heaven, we are just, uh, we're so thankful that uh, that we can uh, open up our hearts and share them with you. And Lord, you you already what, know what's in there. You know what's on our minds. But, uh, Father, sometimes... Uh, um, these things just need to be spoken as a group, and um, and then we can all share and, and help each help in each other's uh, trials and blessings in life. And uh, and Lord, uh, we know that we are we are truly overly blessed in this country in this world um, because of the things that you give us. And the Lord, even the trials and temptations in our lives are a blessing because they strengthen us more for the future. And Father, we thank you for those too. Lord, we do have quite a few people that are that are sick and ailing, and, and different uh, people with uh, cancer. And, um, we think of uh, Fred and and pray for continued healing for him, and um, and just uh, good reports coming back. Um, pray for uh, I know Marlis has a, has a niece Patty that has breast cancer, and uh, and uh, just different ones that uh, that are dealing with cancer. We just uh, we pray, Lord, that. Uh, that you as a great physician can heal that and um, and make it go away because we know you can and we trust in that, Father. Lord, uh, we've got upcoming tests for Thurston. Um, we just pray that uh, good things come of that, that um, that they don't find anything that's uh, that's harmful. We continue to wait for for results for Mark and and Fred both. And uh, Lord, we look forward to uh, to good answers there. And uh, I know. Mark is slowly uh, strengthening himself and getting back to where he was, but it's been a long process, Father, and we just pray for strength and healing in his body and um, and an opportunity to get back to to his full time uh, to work work and um, and may, and may it uh, may he be blessed there with that. Father, we're just uh, we're truly thankful for all the all the people in this church that uh, that contribute and do all that they do. And uh, as we continue our our search for a minister, Father, we're just uh, we're thankful for the for the men that uh, that come forth on on every given Sunday to uh, to preach your word. Uh, we're just thankful for all the hearts that are um, that are strong and truly filled with you. Um, we're thankful for for Greg being here this past couple weeks and giving us the opportunity to not only to listen to to your word through him, but also to uh, to hear the beautiful music that the family presents. And uh, 
Lord, as, uh, as we get ready for this sermon, may our ears be open, may our hearts be touched by uh, the words that Greg has for us this morning. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Again, I want to thank you for the privilege of uh, sharing with you uh, in the way of preaching and singing. I want to say thanks to Brooke and Bree, am I saying it right, uh, for coming here in the Schroeders uh, last night, taking down all the fall decorations and bringing it upstairs and putting up uh, all the de decorations. They look nice, and I appreciate uh, their work and sharing in that way. Ever since the beginning of life on earth, uh, after Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, trouble has existed. Uh, Sometimes people get the idea, well, it's, uh, it's smooth sailing for a Christian. Not so. Women have had to endure the pain of childbirth. Man has had to deal with all sorts of weeds and thistles and thorns. Uh, a few years later, after uh, Adam and Eve sinned, uh, we realize that uh, trouble has come into being. And now a few thousand years later, Jesus was put on, put his life in, on the cross and realized that uh, we suffer in this life. He suffered for us, but we suffer because there's troubles, there's tribulations, there's problems all around us. We shouldn't be surprised. No one is exempt from these problems or physical or whatever it might be. Jesus put all of life into one small verse, two sentences in John chapter 16 in verse 33. And out of reverence for God and his word, would you stand with me for the reading of our text? John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. He didn't say you may have. He didn't say you might be exempt. He said you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let us pray. Father in our God, we realize that we still will go through trials and tribulations and problems and sufferings. But, Father, we realize that the best is yet to come. Guide us and direct us and help us to have the peace and the assurance of salvation. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, and be seated, please. First of all, my first point is troublesome times are here. Uh, can you agree with that? <laughs> troublesome times are here. This world is full of troubles and problems. Right off the bat, man was told he was going to have to work hard for his food. Uh, no more was it going to be provided for him in the beautiful Garden of Eden. And uh, things were, were different. They were cast out of the garden, not allowed to go back in. After a little review, I think we all agree that the Israelites brought a lot of curses and a lot of problems on themselves. God gave them orders, and when they obeyed, they reaped the benefits. But we find out also when they disobeyed, they suffered the consequences. Therefore, the Israelites brought many of their troubles on themselves. Sometimes people ask, why? Why am I going through this? Well, some things just are naturally happen. Uh, sometimes we get sick. Sometimes we have a flat tire, whatever it might be. Some things just naturally happen, but some things we bring on ourselves. The first sub-point this morning is troublesome times existed in Old Testament times. This is nothing new. They've always been around. In 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 1 through 7, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, rose up against Jerusalem and shut off all the supplies into Jerusalem for about two years. By now there was no food for the people, at which time he took the king, brought him unto the king of Babylon. They pronounced judgment on, it, on him. They then killed his sons, the sons of Zebedee, before his eyes, and then put his eyes out and took him to Babylon. 
that was troublesome times. God has allowed these difficult times to come upon people because of their sins. You think about it, God allowed Babylon to overthrow and to take God's chosen people into slavery and into uh, punishment, you might say, because of their sin. Then we read in 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 8 through 10, King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had his captain of the guard go to Jerusalem, burn the house of the Lord and the king's houses and all the houses of Jerusalem and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Why? Because of sin. The Bible shows us what happens to even God's people when they disobey God. It seemed to happen over and over again. You would think at some point they learn their lesson. Have we ever been there? Do we always learn our lesson the first time around? What happened then could still happen today. This is when we, God's people, need to stand strong. Just remember, God does not punish us without warning us in advance. How many times? Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 through 3. Here's what it says. Now it shall come to pass, if, if you diligently obey the voice of of the Lord your God, who observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So we see there are blessings, and God tells them, here's what, here's what you can have if, if you will obey. But then we come to the word, but. <laughs> in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to obey carefully his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. It's our choice, isn't it, with some things in life, not with everything, but when it comes to blessings and cursings from God, we normally bring it upon ourselves. We find in verse 16 all the way down through verse 68 all the bad things that will happen if we disobey God. And if you're asking, why does this happen? We're God's people. Why do we suffer? Well, Deuteronomy 28 verse 47 says, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and with gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. Now, notice what it said. You did not serve the Lord your God with what? With joy and with gladness. Does it matter how we serve God? Oh, I think so. <laughs> you, you think God notices? Does God observe how we serve him? Look at verse 62. Because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. So we bring some things upon ourselves. Then we also read about Daniel and his three friends uh, who were carried away into captivity. And though they were good workers and good slaves for the king of Babylon, when it came to bowing down and worshiping the king and his idols, this is where they drew the line. And though the king reminds them of what he could do to them, if they don't, notice what they said in response. Look at Daniel chapter 3, verse 17. They said, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not. In other words, we know God can do this, even though... How hot you have the furnace. God, our God, can deliver us. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. You see, they drew the line. They knew where they stood, and they stood firm on their faith with Jehovah God. They made it very clear that their God is able to, to deliver them. And you'll notice also their faith did not rest upon the fact whether God chose 
to deliver them or not. They still were not going to disobey God. So they said, either way, we will not fall down and worship you or your God. So in troublesome times, they stood strong in their faith. Now, it's also important to remember that troublesome times didn't end there because our subpoint B makes it very plain. Troublesome times existed in New Testament times as well. Troublesome times existed in the New Testament times as well, during the life of Christ. In fact, all of the apostles, except John, who's called John the Beloved, died a martyr's death. That means they were put to death because of their faith. And we today would say, well, why would I want to serve the Lord if I'm going to die for that cause? They were willing to go to the grave also, believing that Jesus came, died, was buried, rose again, and they continued preaching that to their grave. Now, if you're telling people a lie, when it comes near the time of your life it's ending, you're, you're going you're gonna to confess up. You're going to say, you know, I, I've said this all along, but now let me, let me make this story straight. Well, they went to their grave telling the world that Jesus is alive. People sometimes criticize Thomas. They say they call him Doubting Thomas because Thomas said when the other apostles had seen the Lord, he said, I'm not going to believe it unless I see for myself the holes in his hand and the, the, and the scar in his side where, where he was pierced with the sword. Unless I see for myself, I will not believe. Well, that's not doubting. You see, our faith rests upon eyewitness testimony of Jesus Christ. If others had simply said, well, some of the apostles saw it, and so we believe it because they said it was so. No, they needed to be eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. So troublesome times existed in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. When the church was persecuted, what happened? They, the church was scattered abroad, but they went everywhere doing what? Preaching the word. You notice they did not go into hiding. They didn't say, oh, we're afraid they're coming after us. No, no, no. The church was persecuted and they were scattered. But as they went their way, they went everywhere preaching the word. Therefore, our faith must remain in Christ no matter what comes our way. We need to reach out to others for people are as much closer to God during persecution. So we need to choose not to persecute God or hold God. How many times do people cause God to suffer because they said, well, you know, I, I went through difficult times or whatever. Uh, things didn't go as smoothly as I thought they would be. And so they punished God because of it. The Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 36, and here now you remember where this is found, Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. Just think about Matthew two dozen, three dozen, okay? Matthew two dozen, three dozen, 24, 36. But of that day and that hour, talking about Jesus coming again, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Do you realize people who tell you, Jesus, Jesus is coming back on this date? They do not know. They do not know. Jesus said, nobody knows except my Father which is in heaven. Where's that found? Matthew 2 dozen, 3 dozen. There you go. Thank you. Listen, it isn't important that we figure out exactly when Jesus is coming again. What is important? Anybody know? To know that he is coming and to be ready when he does come. The sad thing is people get so sidetracked in trying to figure out the end of time and this is going to happen and that's going to happen. You know why a lot of times they want to do that? So they can do their own thing until they think it's getting close and I'd better make things right with God. Listen, you don't need to put it off. You don't have the promise of tomorrow. Our life could be just like that. Uh, and so we need to be ready when Jesus comes again. Not only did the apostles die a martyr's death, 
What does the Bible say about Paul? They watched the gates of the city day and night in Acts 9, verse 24, so they could catch Paul and kill him. Now, keep in mind, later they stoned Paul and they drug him out of the city and left him for dead in Acts 14, verse 19. Don't forget, Paul never had it rough until after he accepted the Lord and began, began to be a worker for, for Christ. Prior to that, he had it made. Why the, he made the Jews happy. He had it. Hey, he had anything he wanted. He had the badge, buddy, of authority. He could have you arrested and put in jail and have you put to death. He had the he went with letters of authority when he went to Damascus, remember? And so he had the power. But after he became a follower of Christ, who did he have problems? That's when everything changed. All the Jews now who were on his side, now they're against him because he's not saying what they want him to say. And so now they're out to kill him. And so they're waiting day and night at the gate to find him that they might kill him. But notice also, the question is, how was Paul able to find peace in troublesome times? And I think Paul gives us the answer in Philippians 4, verse 11. Look, for I have learned, it's a learning process. It's not just something, well, everybody ought to have this. No, it's a learning process. And the, Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am. That means whether you're in Colorado or Florida, whatever, whatever, no, no. But whatever state I am, there with to be content. Paul said, I, I can be happy wherever I am. I can be thankful for wherever I am at that time. So no matter if it's a good day or a bad day, according to you, it's the Lord's day. It's a day that we will rejoice and be glad in it. Paul said, I've learned to be content. Now, keep in mind again, Paul was in prison <laughs> at this time. When he wrote this book, and we find he's encouraging Christians to be content while he's in prison. Contentment is the ability to accept things as they are, to deal with whatever comes our way. To the Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God was number one at all times, during good times and during troublesome times. And remember when Jesus was trying, was, uh, trying to prepare his disciples for his departure and for his death and for his leaving and going back to heaven? It was in his troublesome times. They didn't see it coming. They weren't just going to accept that. Remember Peter said, Lord, he said, I I'll always be with you. Even if I die, I'll stand with you. I'll never deny you. Oh, be careful. <laughs> be careful what you say. And, and, you know, remember when Peter tried to get in, in front of everything God was doing and Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah. Get thee behind me, Satan. Do you know why Jesus left his throne in heaven and came to earth? He came to die that we might be saved. And Peter was about to get in the way of what Jesus, the reason he came. And so no matter what the problems that we face in life, we need to know where we stand. Number the third, C, uh, sub point here, troublesome times exist in our time. Troublesome times exist in our time. Now, now, let's think for a moment and realize this isn't the first time that America has gone through troublesome times. We think, man, I tell you, this is rough, and it is. We've never seen anything like this pandemic. But America has gone through troubles all along. In 1917 to 1919, there was a flu epidemic, and uh, that's over 100 years ago. The world was dealing with a pandemic much like we're dealing with today. In 1917, the flu epidemic, in 19, uh, on down we could go in 76 and 2000. What, what happened in September the 11th, 19, 20 uh, years ago? Uh, terrorists crashed, 
passenger planes into Twin Towers and 2,996 people died. During this time, church buildings were filled and people were praying and turning back to God. 2005, uh, tropical cyclones killing almost 1,800 people. Hurricane Katrina, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Kentucky, and Ohio were affected. Tied with Hurricane Harvey, it was the costliest national disaster in U.S. history, over $125 billion. In 2009, the swine flu came through, killing 575,000. And yet when things are going great, do you know what happens? People forget God. They turn away from God. They, they go out and forget all about uh, their commitment to God. They feel they don't need God. God anymore. How easy it is to forget, isn't it? Though times are bad right now, they could get worse. They could get, we've had a vacation, haven't we? In our faith, we really have. We haven't gone through difficult times. But now we have the virus, the pandemic, and five or six hurricanes hit the southern coast, Louisiana, Texas, Missouri, uh, uh, this year alone, five or six hurricanes have gone through that area. God will not forget his faithful ones. The big thing is, will we forget God? Even though as God's people, we are not exempt from troublesome times. In fact, it is through these times we realize how great God is, and we are reminded this world is not our home. We're just passing through. I like to tell people, this is decision time. This is where we decide where we want to go, where we want to spend eternity. And so that we're not home in this life. So we should never imply that we're going to, it's going to be smooth sailing. I, I don't like it when preachers try to preach that to people and tell them, hey, everything is going to be great when you put the Lord first. No. That's when the devil's lost you, and that's when he's going to come after you, and he's going to do all he can to get you to turn your back on God. We like to talk about upbeat, positive things that people want to hear, but that's not how it is. That kind of preaching may actually make people feel good, but it will not help them stand strong during troublesome times, which is why people are questioning God and sometimes asking why, where is God through all of it? Why does God allow this to happen? This isn't anything new. Troublesome times have always been there. But they think it's supposed to be smooth sailing. Oh, really? Listen, where do we get the idea that all is well? And we have all been fed this fairy tale that as a Christian, everything is going to be great. Many are being told that once they become a Christian, they're their problems are over. Just remember what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to the man, to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear. Do you understand what the Bible is saying there? You can never say it was more than I can handle. Because the Bible said it isn't. You'll never be able to say, my neighbor made me. No. You'll never be able to say, well, the devil made me. No. God will give you a way of escape. He will help you bear whatever comes your way. But many have been told, living on earth as a Christian will be smooth sailing. No more sickness. No more stress, no more suffering, no more tears, no more diabetes, no more cancer, no more surgeries. Because after all, we're God's people. We're part of God's family. And yes, this is the promise to God's people, but not here and not now. This world is not home. So in the middle of our troubles, we can take to heart and have peace. Not because life is easy, but because God is great. Because the hard times of this life are only temporary, 
And when you think about it, it helps us to focus on that which is eternal. Because what we go through here now is only temporary. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, For our light affliction, <laughs> this isn't anything, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You know, I, I kind of tell people, you know, the older you get, the worse things get. You, you realize that? We hurt, we ache, we suffer, we, we have doctor's appointments. You know, used to, uh, in Florida, there's a lot of older people in the congregation where I minister. Used to, you would wonder when you go knocking on the door, are they at work or, or you know, are they home or, or whatever. Now, you ask, have they got a doctor's appointment? Are they, you know, are they somewhere? Uh, but we realize it's but for a moment. It helps us to realize when we suffer and we have a migraine or we have an ingrown toe or whatever it might be, this is only temporary. The best is yet to come. Our peace is not in the absence of strife or trouble, but in Jesus who has gone to prepare a place for us, John 14, verse 2. I'm reminded of Mr. Spafford, who was a very wealthy attorney and real estate investor who lost everything during the Chicago fire in 1871. Then only two years later, he sent his wife and four daughters on a trip to England. In that journey, the ship sank, and he lost his four daughters in that crash. And yet in the midst of all that pain and that sorrow, he is the one who wrote the most comforting hymn, It is well with my soul. After going through, losing everything he had, and losing his four daughters in that, uh, in that uh, shipwreck. Psalms chapter 30, verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Isn't that great? Yes, we, we'll go through trials. We'll cry. We'll have problems. We'll have heartache. But joy cometh in the morning. That, my friend, is peace in troublesome times. Psalms 24, or 23 and verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Psalms 23, verse 4. So yes, there were troublesome times in the Old Testament. There were troublesome times in the New Testament. There are troublesome times in our lives. But all of this is introduction, okay? This is the best part. This is what I want you to get. The best is yet to come. Number three, Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Jesus is coming again. The song I've been sharing with you, uh, uh, dealing with troublesome times, and Jesus is coming again, it doesn't end there. In the midst of this gloom and doom, we find true believers set their sights on heaven. Listen, we need God in good times and in bad times. John 16, verse 33 says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will, you will, you will have tribulation. But, it doesn't end there, so let's read on. But be of good cheer. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Now, do you know what that means? John 14, verse 19, that we read in Sunday school this morning, Jesus said, because I live, what? You shall live. That's right. Because I live, you shall live. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Listen, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, death and the grave. Jesus overcame. Do you know when that song was written that we talked about, uh, Jesus is coming soon, during World War II? Now remember the song goes on. Here's what it says. Troublesome times, troubles will soon be o'er. Happy forevermore. When we meet on that shore, free from all care. Rising up in the sky, telling this world goodbye. 
Homeward we then shall fly, glory to share. The song says, telling this world goodbye. <laughs> Wave goodbye, will you? Wave goodbye to trouble. Wave goodbye to problems. Wave goodbye to trouble sometimes because all of that's going to be history. And when we get to heaven and get that new body and are in all eternity, what little things we suffered in this life won't mean anything. Don't hold God back. Don't punish God because you say, somebody didn't speak to me. They hurt my feelings. I, I did a lot in the church and my name wasn't in the bulletin. I sang in the choir. And they didn't give me the introduction. They gave somebody else. We suffer such minor things in this life. And Satan will do all he can to keep you out of heaven. But don't you let a hypocrite or anyone else stand between you and God, okay? We have eternity awaiting us. Here's what the Bible said, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. When you face somebody who's going through difficult, you know, the sad thing is there are people, Christians, who think, I don't need to go to church. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know who they're thinking about? Me, myself, and I. I'm all right with God. And uh, if he comes again, when he comes again, I'll, I'll be ready. So I, I, don't, I don't need to go to church. Do you know what they're forgetting about is other people that might be going through troublesome times, difficult times. And they need their brother and sister here to encourage them. You may say, well, I'm having a good week. Well, that's wonderful. Come to church and help somebody who isn't having a good week. We need one another, amen. There will never come a time when you think in life, well, I, I don't need God or I don't need the church or I don't need my family. You realize how important your family is in Christ. So, yes, troublesome times will come, but just remember Jesus is coming again, and I believe it won't be long. Acts 14, verse 22, the Bible says, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> it's not a sermon you think a lot about, does it? It's not a sermon you hear a lot about. Troublesome. Well, I'm going to go to church today and the preacher is going to preach on troublesome times. <laughs> but they're there. They exist. We all go through them. It's not an easy road. In Acts 14, verse 22, talks about the strengthening uh, one another. And in Luke chapter 10, in verse 20, here's what the Bible says. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Have you ever had days that you, you just didn't feel like rejoicing? You didn't feel like smiling? You didn't feel like being happy? It's been a rough road. But Jesus said, no matter what your problems are, no matter what your tribulation may be, Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. As Christians, we have so much to look forward to. But if you're here today and you're not a child of God, you're not in Christ, remember what one of the passages we read early on talks about those who are in Christ. And it's, it's important that you have done what Jesus has commanded you to do. You'll never earn heaven. I want to make that clear. You'll never do enough to say, I, I deserve, I want what I deserve. Oh, I don't want what I deserve. I want mercy. I want mercy. But Jesus said there are certain things we've got to do in order to receive his gift of salvation. It is a gift. But you've got to believe with all your heart that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. Except you believe, you'll, you'll not be saved. You've got to repent. What does that mean? It means you've got to change. 
You say, well, I've been this way all my life. It's just the way I am. Then you need to change. That's what repentance is. You say, well, it's, uh, it's hard, to, hard to be different. What I'm not, then that's what repentance is all about. The Bible makes it very plain, except you repent, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Two more verses down, repeats it again. Jesus says, I tell you, but except you repent, you shall not have eternal life. So we've got to repent. We've got to confess him before men. That means we've got to go public. We can't be ashamed of Christ. Can't be ashamed of his words. We've got to be baptized into Christ. Why? Is that really important? Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I believe what Jesus said, don't you? And notice salvation comes after belief and baptism. He that believeth and is baptized, future tense, shall be saved. Now the world will tell you, well, he that believeth, and they'll took a giant step, and they'll say, and is saved, it's a good thing. You ought to go back and be baptized. Why? <laughs> why would you want to bury? Why would you want to kill something that's already alive and saved and right with God? Why would you want to go back? Do you understand that baptism is, is a death? It's a burial. It's a resurrection. It's where you die to the old man of sin. It's where you arise to walk in a newness of life. It's putting off the old man and putting on the new man in Christ Jesus. Baptism has so much to do. But the main thing is it's there we contact the blood. What does the song say? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Christ that washes away our sins. And then we've got to be faithful until the very end. Now, if you're here today and you're not ready for that trumpet to sound and Jesus to come again, I encourage you to come. I was in a revival meeting one time in West Virginia. And it was a crooked road, and, and the road literally ended at, at the church house. It, it just went back in this curve and stopped right at the church house. It didn't go any further. And uh, we heard one night uh, some boys were there every night of the revival, but one night they weren't there, and somebody said they went camping up on the mountain. Great storm came up that night, and one of the boys was talking about the, well, the Lord could be coming by right now. <laughs> Look at that sky. Look at the lightning. Well, this could be the hour Jesus comes again. And the other one said, "I it can't be. I'm not ready. I haven't been baptized. He's intending to during the revival. But he said, I haven't been. He can't come back now. They took up camp, and they came down off that mountain and came to the church house, and they started banging, banging on the parsonage door. Open up, open up. I want to be baptized right now. And we took him and baptized him into Christ. Why? Because he knew he wouldn't be ready. That was the hour Jesus came again. Do you know? Do you have the hope? Do you have the peace? You can have it. If you know I had done what Jesus said to do, to receive the gift of eternal life, will you come? Will you surrender? As we stand and sing our hymn of invitation, come. Just as I am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me.
where you come in leading and closing from. Uh, I, I went the wrong song. It's supposed to be in trust, uh, trust and Obey, I think. But uh, anyway, uh, we're thankful to be here, thankful you're here. Keep on keeping on. Amen. Uh, we get a chance to come back a year or two or five or ten from now. I hope to see you faithful to the Lord. That's the most important thing of all is to have this fellowship that will last forever in eternity. Let's pray. Father and our God, thank you that we can be here, that we can honor you. And even though problems come and troublesome times are here, our names are written in heaven. And the best is yet to come. Help us to be faithful. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Have a blessed week.